Hello, my name is Blake Patterson, and welcome to Real Values. On this week's episode, I discuss my favorite movies of 1983. Now, here are a few honorable mentions. Angst, The Dead Zone, Scarface, Strange Brew, and Trading Places. Number 10, War Games. Of the American genre films that dealt with the Cold War, War Games is the most entertaining in its manipulation of genre tropes and the winning performances from its charming ensemble, from Matthew Broderick to Dabney Coleman. What could be didactic in its messaging is an absorbing political thriller under the guise of a teen movie. Even if the movie is a product of its time, War Games' themes are resonant when one fears what could happen globally today. Number 9, Fanny and Alexander. Ingmar Bergman's sociological and semi-autobiographical portrait of the auteur's childhood is a potent drama, particularly in its inclusion of an abusive stepfather. Due to the tragedy of these circumstances, the movie explains Bergman's interest in fantasy as an escape. While the film may not be my favorite among Bergman's masterpieces, Fanny and Alexander is a drama unlikely to be forgotten due to the psychological nature of Bergman's approach. Number 8. The King of Comedy Martin Scorsese's The King of Comedy was famously dismissed by many critics because it was so different than what they would have expected from the auteur after Raging Bull. The movie is a cringe-inducing satire of celebrity culture and those who obsess over them to dangerous degrees. In the internet era, the idea of people obsessing over celebrities is timely, disturbing, and tragic in how it shows a troubled man going to great lengths to be like his hero, a late-night talk show host named Jerry Langford. The excellence of the performances contributes to the overwhelming morbidity of the finale. Number 7. Possession In Possession, Andrzej Zalowski incorporates the flawed marriage as horror element to explore the depths of the problem. In this case, the distance between husband and wife emanates the worst tendencies in both characters. Isabel Adjani and Sam Neill embrace the theatricality of the material. There is shock and laughter, yet it all builds up to a haunting climax. The film also works in how it includes the sound effects of airplanes and explosions, to emanate Cold War angst around the center of a dysfunctional marriage. Number 6, The Right Stuff. Philip Kaufman's The Right Stuff is a true patriotic film without the saccharine or jingoistic tropes of many films with this label. The Right Stuff is a spellbinding exploration of the space program and concerns the important figures of Mercury, who experienced troubling matters. Even though it failed financially and led to the downfall of the Ladd Company, the right stuff is an achievement where the intimate and epic meet each other halfway. Number 5. Videodrome David Cronenberg's Videodrome exists primarily as a front against the desensitization of graphic programs on television, but it also subtly addresses how television moderators would take control of their audience in the face of entertainment. The film features James Woods' strongest performance and how he ranges from acrimony to reservation as Max Wren. For all its well-established tricks to sicken the audience, Videodrome's most emotional achievement is how it haunts the viewer long after it is over due to Cronenberg's ideas. Number 4, Pauline at the Beach. In America at this time, Eric Romare's Pauline at the Beach would have been a relief considering the number of awful sex farces. The movie deconstructs the archetypes of the subgenre, 
and develop situations authentically to humanely explore the character's behavior toward each other and the consequences they face. Like other Romare masterpieces, the motion picture is aesthetically elegant in its consideration of the setting, and it complements the delicacy of Romare's approach toward his characters. Number three, Terms of Endearment. For some people, James L. Brooks's Terms of Endearment may be easy to dismiss due to its Oscar win against other movies, such as The Right Stuff. However, one of the reasons Terms of Endearment is a lasting achievement is Brooks's direction of his gifted ensemble and how they portray their characters flaws and all. The movie beautifully evolves in its humor and eventual tragedy, and each element works due to Brooks's handling of the conflicts and the remarkable performances, particularly Deborah Winger. Number two, Quirrell. With its colorful and radically designed soundstage, Rainer Werner Fassbender's last film recalls the beautiful artifice of the early Hollywood melodramas as he creates a vivid portrayal of lust and violence. Fassbender examines themes of sexual repression, despair, and identity with performers who are willing to embrace the passion of his piece. Even though it is his final film, Quirrell represents a director progressing in his style, and this progression makes Quirrell all the more tragic as Fassbender's last feature. And number one, Star 80. Bob Fosse's swan song is a bleak portrait of fame, jealousy, greed, and exploitation in the porn industry, with a terrifying performance by Eric Roberts. Through Mariel Hemingway's youthful naivete and Roberts's bruised masculinity, Fosse plunges into the tragedy of these lives and displays the darkness of where people can go if they do not receive what they desire. Fosse shows his audience what will happen, but the frequent question is how the tragedy will occur. Some people may hate Star 80, but they will never forget it. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great night.